so, so that sort of whole view of the world began to crumble. So where we are today is that system is crumbling. And I was taken back that on Thursday, the moment I turned on the BBC, the news is all about financial markets are, crisis, are in real crisis in Europe. I mean, we know the Greek debt and all of that. But the main problem was Germany's growth had gone down. You all, you all know that? But how hard can the Germans work? How much are you supposed to produce? How much are you supposed to continuously make and send somewhere else? Who is going to buy this stuff? So you, but you're trying. You're doing a great job. Okay? But think about it. What's going to happen? We can't. We can't keep doing this. Okay? But the Americans believe you can. You can constantly do these things. The problem is there'll be no one to buy the stuff because there's no money around. Of course, the banks talk about liquidity, but a lot of that is paper money, okay? So we're in a real, real problem. I mean, what's Greece going to do? And this should be close to all German taxpayers' minds. What are the Greece going to do? What are they going to make and sell? Think about it. So, I just want you to think, this is where we are. Now I want to go back to Asia and say why I believe, and then we'll have some questions, why I believe in Asia we cannot follow this trajectory. I think the last breaths of this 300 years of exploitative under, underpricing uh, mechanisms, most of the world is in denial. Okay? We'll take another 30 years maybe. The next 30 years will be very, very painful. There was a very interesting article in the Financial Times on Tuesday by a contributor who said basically what I'm saying, but in a different way. He said it'll be 70 years in the West of major, redu major um, readjustment. In my view, it's not readjustment that's going to be bad. I think it's going to be, if you believe in more equitable societies, a good readjustment. But unless politicians begin to articulate this very clearly. But unfortunately, all the politicians want to articulate is the next quarter will be better. Please work harder, make something more, and sell it. Someone in China, Africa, or USA is going to buy it. It's not going to go on. It's, it, that game is over. But it might take 30, 40 years. He says f f 70. But he says the main thing that will need to happen in Europe is a realization that the privilege is over. So this is not just me saying this. The privilege is over. How do we readjust? And that I leave it to you, good people, to discover how that is. Now I want to just quickly, in my next five minutes to close off, talk about Asia. In 2050, the population of the world is about 9.5 billion people, right? Just imagine, though, about 100 years ago, the population of the world, 2050, 150 years from 2050, the population of the world was 1 billion people. Thousands of years of human history peaked at 1 billion, and then we went, whew, okay? And at the same time, we devised technologies to be able to extract everything and anything we want from every part of the world. At this point, if any of you are feeling depressed, please, please, take a deep breath. I'm not, uh, I'm not, an, uh, I'm not a, uh, a pessimist. I think I'm an optimist, but we must face the facts. Population of Asia will be six, five to six billion people, 60% of the world's population. Do any of you believe, rationally, that five billion Asians can live like Americans? No. You don't need to be a rocket scientist. You just know, no, not possible. Give you, give you one estimation, again, cars. In the US, car ownership is about 750 cars per thousand people. Today in China, car ownership, China is already the world's largest car market. Do you know what the car ownership levels are in China? About only 150. In India, car ownership levels are only about 30. Indians haven't started driving. But the good story in India is the cars, the roads are so bad, maybe they will never start to drive like you guys do. Okay, no autobahns in India for a long time. Okay? Yeah. Weak government. <laughs> okay. So, so the problem is if Chinese and Indians and Indonesians aspire to car levels that you have, take for granted, and which all everyone is saying we have a human right, and it's good for the global economy. Do you know how many cars there will be in the world? More than 3 billion cars. Today, the world's entire 
population of vehicles is about 800 to 900 million. Four times the amount, okay? Of where, what will these things run on? Not electric cars. This is science fiction, right? So, what would, so we, that future is not possible, but no one's talking about it. Instead, we have people talking about greening. Not going to happen. And I can go on about meat consumption, to electronic devices, to a whole range of things that we take as our right to consume. It's not going to happen. So in Asia, we can't follow this. We have to reject this. So my argument is that rejection will require very, very strong governments in Asia to start firstly explaining that we can't have this. And then putting in place laws, etc., that essentially define what you can and can't have. I will go further and say, hey, take for example, I've said this in Singapore. Take Singapore, for example. The average Singaporean today lives in a nice house and has air conditioning when they sleep. How many of you have been to Singapore or Southeast? You know, okay? It's warm. But there's a reason it's warm. It's near the equator. There's a reason. Uh, but people want to air condition their homes to 20 degrees C and sleep. But they don't pay for that right because the energy is underpriced. Now, the Singaporean government knows this, this is not possible forever. You need to pay. If you want to sleep at 19 degrees C in, in the tropics, you pay $1,000 US per night to sleep. You can have it. We're not taking away your right. But you will not underprice everything and have a free ride. I would argue, without being too unfair, most car owners in these countries have a free ride. Basically, the whole entire infrastructure for the auto industry is paid by taxpayers, and the car owners take a free ride, and gasoline is underpriced, all of those things. Those excesses will come to an end. We, we, are, we have to move beyond that. So in Asia, we have to reject this. So in my book, I argue what Asian governments need to do is start to be more honest and try to explain that those are not possible. And there's one good reason they must do it, and then I, I will end. And very simple. Today, the Asia's population is about 3.5 billion people. Just between China and India, the population is almost 3 billion, uh, 2 .8 billion people. Okay? The majority of Asians don't have what you think Asia's rise means. Most people sit in the U.S. And, 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 and Europe and think, oh, the Asians are all getting rich, etc. The consuming classes in Asia who buy your cars and your great technology, at the most are 500 million people. Right? That means less than, uh, less than a third of what's the population. So most Asians haven't started consuming, but they are being told they can. The problem is they can't because there's not enough. Okay? They can't. The conversation therefore needs to be governments that say you can't and then take actions. And I, su I suggest just three actions that governments in Asia to take because their legitimacy will depend on taking these strong actions. First one is that because resources are constrained, and I think no one disagrees, and technology will not fix the problem, resource, uh, the economy, ec any economic activity, which is not just growth, but economic activity which enables human progress, in which in my in case, I argue in the book, should be about the basic rights, not freedom of speech, uh, will, will, will need to take precedence, uh, will, will need to be subservient to maintaining vitality of natural systems. Most of us take for granted that tomorrow I can lose my mobile phone and never have a mobile phone, but I can live. But I can't live if the water systems, the food systems, all are degraded, which is what's happening. Second, of course, is the fact that resource use must be equitable for, future, for current and future generations. And therefore, Rather than talk UN language about sustainability and all of that, the most important thing is going to be that collective welfare will take precedence over individual rights. Again, this flies in the face of sort of liberal democratic capitalist systems, and I'm happy to take questions about what I mean. But the collective interest must take precedence over individual rights. Today in Asia, the collective interest of a minority, the, no, the interest of a minority through an economic model that privileges them is running roughshod over the collective welfare of the majority. And we can go into that a bit more. The third point I make is that resources need to be repriced. 
in, in many ways. So the underpricing that started with slavery, colonialism, etc., and now is in cost-cutting in companies, etc., must stop. Why do so many factories go to China from, from the West? Underpricing. It's called the Harvard business model, business school model. Underpriced everything. It became what we taught at business schools. It became legitimate. It, they gave it legitimacy, but it's underpricing. It is taking it all. Why, how are European countries going to reduce their carbon dioxide? It's called outsourcing. Send it somewhere else. Okay? So we, we need to understand this cannot go away. So we need to reprice resources, and for that, we need to redefine productivity as defined today by Western economies, which is, today productivity is defined as how do we use people, and that means less people, to use as much resources as possible. Productivity going forward needs to be flipped around. How do we use resources and not people? Meaning, how do we efficiently use resources and not people? For simple, prob simple reason. In Asia, our problem is very different. Productivity, as viewed from the Western world of economies, going back 200 years, was we have so few people, we have so much resources, now we need to create economic growth. Therefore, let's invent machines, industrial age, etc., and let's create growth, underprice everything, but let's use the resources. Today, we have a completely different problem. We have so many people and limited resources. What we need to do is keep people employed, therefore use as many people as possible, and as little resources. So productivity should be focused on resources rather than people. And the reason why Asian governments should do it, it comes back to my thing about 500 million people only consume, the majority don't. Along this path, the majority will always find their conditions getting worse, which is what we see in Asia. And the legitimacy of our governments will depend on reversing this current, what, I, what is closely called, loosely called the Washington Consensus which is a post-Second World War narrative that if you, you encourage consumption-led growth, you follow the Western model, everything will be okay. That era is over, and this is why Asian governments must reject it. I'll finish by saying, I am not sure Asian governments will do this. But if Asian governments don't do this, then all this talk about environmental improvement, resource management, a parity of incomes, human justice, we can forget about this. Because the countries that matter in the 21st century will be the most populated countries of the world, which would be China, Indonesia, India, etc. And But this is not to say the West mustn't do anything. I just don't know if Western governments, at the moment, as weak as they are, can do anything about it. And I certainly don't expect the, the USA to lead. Uh, they will not lead. Yet in Europe, I feel, maybe German, Germany is a bit different, there's a kind of intellectual subservience to the Americans. Maybe that's a Second World War hangover. But Europe needs to think differently and, and start to have a different narrative with Asia. We need to understand in Asia, we can't live like you. And there's a new narrative, but it'll be a more equitable society. I keep going on, but I shut up now. Thank you.